dedicated to empowering you with information to make positive choices and be advocates for your overall well-being. Welcome to The Health View. Welcome to The Health View. My name is Yvonne Dunnitz. Today, we're going to be talking about kidney stones with Dr. Gary Dunnitz, urologist and author. Kidney stone disease is one of the oldest and most common problems of the urinary system. More than one million Americans will get a kidney stone this year. The number of people in the United States getting stones is rising. In 1980, about three in every 100 people got a stone at some point in their life. In 1994, that number rose to about five in every 100 people. By 2010, almost nine in 100 people were expected to get a stone in their lifetime. Children getting kidney stones has almost become more common in recent years. Kidney stones attacks lead to more than 2 million healthcare provider visits and 600,000 emergency room visits each year. The diagnosis, treatment, and prevention of kidney stones, as well as the lost time from work because of stones, cost almost $5.3 billion each year. I am delighted to welcome Dr. Gary Dunnitz, urologist and author. Welcome, Dr. Dunnitz. Thank you. We're delighted to have you here with us. And Dr. Dunnitz, you have over 30 years of practice in the field of urology, having trained at Boston University Medical Center. From the perspective of kidney stones, what is the significance of a urologist treating someone with a kidney stone? <clears throat> Well, Yvonne, urologists are trained in handling kidney stones for both men and women. Fortunately, many people with stones will pass them spontaneously. So for those people, a urologist is not required. Generally, it's the primary care physician and the emergency room if they end up in the emergency room. But if a stone is too large to pass, if they're struggling to pass the stone, they're going to be referred to a urologist who is an expert trained to handle the uh, various procedures to help them uh, rid themselves of stones. Before we delve into the stone aspect of it, what does a urologist do? What do you treat? Well, urologists are basically surgeons, but they also have a large medical practice. And what the organs and systems that are involved are very simply in a man, it's the entire urinary system as well as the genital system. And in women, it's the urinary system which is a very critical part of the human anatomy. Okay, and what in fact is a kidney stone? Kidney stones come in all shapes and sizes, and there are various types of stones, but the most common stone would be the calcium stone, calcium oxalate stone. Approximately 80% of stones are composed of calcium. Then you've got stones made of uric acid. You've heard of uric acid. People with gout, uh, for instance, make uric acid. And that's about 7%. An additional 7% are actually formed by infection, by bacteria, which we'll get into shortly. Mm -hmm. And then there's a very small subset of other stones, including cysteine stones, which are exceedingly rare. But stones are basically made of minerals, crystalline minerals, and the world is full of minerals. And your body certainly has all types of different minerals, and unfortunately, in some people, these crystallize and become stones. Now, I've heard that kidney stones can be as painful as someone going through pregnancy and delivering a baby. Is that correct? I can tell you from my women patients, yes. they say it's worse than childbirth wow. and, and you don't have a baby at the end. Oh, my goodness. So, so tell us, what exactly is, you know, people hear kidney stones. Is sure. it like a stone that we see out in an earth? What is it like, and what are the differences in the sizes of them? <clears throat> so the average stone for most people, I would say, is five millimeters or less. Yeah. And we use the metric system in medicine. Sure. There's 2.54 uh, centimeters per inch. Okay. So a five millimeter stone, I'll hold this up to the camera. 
millimeters. This this is probably bigger than five millimeters. So it's almost a little bit yes. of the tip of the of a finger. Very small. Uh huh. Not usually perfectly round as I depicted. So okay. many of them are spiculated. Meaning? So they have little horns, little irregularities, and you can imagine. So little jaggedness. Picture this in your eyelid. Your eyelid is very sensitive. Of course. The ureter, the lining. Uh, of the tube draining from the kidneys, these get stuck in there. Wow, you have a wonderful model. Yes, Could I we do. show our, our audience Sir. exactly <clears throat> what it would be like and where it comes down and sure. where the kidneys are? All right, so. Dr. Gary, tell us about the urinary system so that we can understand first what the system is, and then we'll talk about what causes stones to be created in the body. Certainly. Most people are fortunate to have two kidneys. Okay. There's one on each side of the body, deep in the rib cage. Okay. The kidneys are remarkable organs. They filter the blood. They adjust various elements in the body and excrete the waste products in the urine. So the toxins are coming throughout the kidney. Absolutely. And remarkably, because they're very strong filters, 20% of every pulse of blood goes through the kidneys. Really? Remarkable amount. Wow. In essence, this is, this is the outside of the kidney. Yeah. This is the left side of the body. Mm -hmm. That's the adrenal gland, which sits above the kidney. Okay. This is obviously a model, and this is a cut surface of the kidney. And this shows how the kidney uh, forms urine and drains urine. So the urine is formed in what we call the parenchyma. This is the meat of the kidney. That's Meaning? The, that's where the urine is filtered. Okay. That's the heart of the kidney. Okay. The urine forms in the outer part, and it goes into the tubes here. These are called the calyces. That's the drainage port. So each part of the kidney, there's a little uh, area that drains into its respective calyx. Okay. And the urine travels down through this. This is called the infundibulum. Okay. And hits the renal pelvis. This is the biggest drainage part of the kidney. Okay. That renal pelvis hooks up to the ureter. Okay. You have two ureters. Uh -huh. Each ureter travels down. Into the bladder. Into the bladder. Okay. And the ureters have muscle in it. The ureters pulse the urine through. Oh. The bladder fills with urine. Okay. And then when it's convenient, the bladder contracts and the urine comes out through the urethra. Now you were mentioning the model is of a, a, a man, it, well, but it's the same process? Right. Okay. Uh, the, the only reason why this is a male model, this is the prostate. Okay. So in a female, this isn't there and the urethra is still there, of course. Okay. So now, how are kidney stones created, and what are the symptoms of having kidney stones? Certainly. Kidney stone formation really comes about, uh, in essence, when the elements, such as calcium, which mm -hmm. is the most common type of stone, becomes insoluble in urine. So you remember when you were probably in grade school and they taught you about solubility? They took a uh, a um, glass and you filled it with sugar and you stirred it and it was dissolved and you put more and more sugar in, mm -hmm. eventually the crystals fall out. Okay. Well, the same thing happens in the human body. So the calcium comes out okay. into the urine. All right. If there's too much calcium for it to be soluble, you uh -huh. start forming crystals. Uh -huh. The crystals form deep in the parenchyma in the tissue part of the kidney. They can gradually grow in some people. They get bigger and bigger and eventually rupture through the membrane. Yeah. And then you have a piece of hard material in the collecting system. So that's where the stone begins, So how deep in the collecting system. What would be your first sign of a symptom of this happening? That's an excellent question. So for many people, mm -hmm. there are no symptoms at all. Really? You're feeling absolutely fine sitting here at the table. You've never had a stone. Yeah. And you may go on for 5, 10, 15, 20 years or a whole lifetime, never have any pain. And that's because they're automatically just passing through and being able to push through easily within the system? In some respect. So okay. sometimes the stones are very small. Okay. And they'll go right through, shoot right through. This model is actually fairly accurate. The size of a ureter yes. is about that big. Okay. And if the stone is small enough, shoots it's right through. through. Uh, some stones never move. They just get stuck up there. And when a stone is stuck, as long as it doesn't cause obstruction, there's no pain. Once it starts traveling down, if the stone is sizable mm -hmm. and it's difficult for the body to 
to get rid of the stone. Often what happens is the stone will get stuck somewhere in the ureter. We can go through the various parts where it gets stuck. Yep. And then urine builds up, which causes swelling of the kidneys. Similar to like when your bowels are distended and you have terrible gas pains. Yes. The kidney gets bigger. It gets full of urine, and that's incredibly painful. Oh. And it's basically called renal colic. Renal means kidney. Yeah. Colic is like colicky pain that yep. people have, babies have. Yes. So the pain comes and goes because what happens is the urine builds up, mm -hmm. the kidney swells. Mm -hmm. Eventually, the urine squirts through, and the pain goes away because the kidney decompresses and the nerves stop firing. So the pain comes and goes. It could be absolutely excruciating. Typically, somebody that's passing a stone, you'll see them walking around the room, hands like this. They're panting. They're absolutely miserable. Ten minutes later, they're fine. Because then it's passed. And, well, the stone may not pass, but the urine passes. The urine passes. So does a stone, you were saying about where the, the stone right. can get caught. Tell us about there, that. There are particular parts of the anatomy that are subject to obstruction. So number one, the calyx itself, many times the stones just sit in here because this infundibulum right here, that's a very large infundibulum, yeah. and in actuality it's a lot smaller. And that's a passageway. That's a tube, yeah. yep. And there's muscle in there. So all through the urinary system there's muscle pushing the urine down. So it's kind of, kind of contracting to move per it down. Peristalsis. Yeah. So the stones could just sit right in the calyx. Okay. It could sort of bottleneck a little bit right there and cause some minor pain in the kidney. Could it sit and never come down and Exactly. In? Oh, what happens when that happens, if it never comes and passes through? Well, it could just stay there and do no harm. It could cause a little bit of pain because only a small part of the kidney is intermittently getting obstructed. Or, on the other hand, it could start growing and filling the entire collecting system. That's called a staghorn stone. Stair corn like a deer having horns. Yes. So the entire collecting system can become a stone in some people. Oh my goodness, that must be very painful. Uh, yes and no, not always. Really? Again. So it's it, clogging the whole if, system. But if there's no obstruction, even though I say the entire system, there's still room for the urine to get around. Oh. So unless it's causing obstruction, there's, there's really no pain. So what does it stay in the lifetime for years in there? Uh, many of those stones are infection stones, so people have recurrent infections. Would that be urinary tract infections? Yes, yes, of course. Oh. But, you, but you asked me where it gets obstructed. Exactly. So getting back, it can get obstructed right there. Yeah. The renal pelvis is patchless. That's a big area where urine can form and stones can sit. But the next point of obstruction is right here. That's called the ureteral pelvic junction. And that is a tight part of the human anatomy. Okay. In fact, some people are born with inadequate muscle in that area. And even without a kidney stone, they end up with swelling of the kidney. Really? That's called a UPJ obstruction. And that's something that may require surgery. In any case, that is a tight part. Some stones get stuck up there in the renal pelvis, uh -huh. causing the entire kidney to get obstructed. For many people, the stone travels down. The next point of obstruction is right here, where the ureter uh, bypasses, goes over the large vessels. These are called ephemeral vessels. Mm -hmm. So there's actually a little kink in the ureter like that. Ooh, so like in a hose, a blocking. There's a little kink. Well, it, it, it's going over a, um, a little mound, yeah. and the stone often gets caught right there. And what happens? Same That's thing. where the pain again? Pain in the kidney. Yep. Kidney is what's causing pain. And then the other spot, mm -hmm. the worst spot, is right here. And that is where in the bladder? This is where the uh, ureter joins the bladder. Okay. And that's called the ureteral vesicle junction. Okay. So where it joins into the bladder muscle or right back there where the orifice is, where the urine comes through. Yes. That whole zone is an area of obstruction for stones. Mm -hmm. So stones can get caught right there. And again, is that the part of the system. opening of where the, the urine comes right. out of? So it's literally blocking the passage for the urine exactly. to move. The, the obstruction, so it's stuck. Yep. The obstruction can be total, uh, in which case the kidney gradually loses function. It's totally obstructed. Or it could be partial, where some urine is getting through, but it's still obstructed. Now, when some urine is getting through, then would somebody notice a difference in the flow of their urine? No. No. So because it wouldn't impact you, them. Because, again, you have two kidneys. Yes. So usually the other kidney works overtime. You're still making just as much urine. Okay. If somebody has one kidney, mm -hmm. which is rare, um, 
then yes, they will notice they'll stop making urine. Wow. And is it common that a kidney stone would just be in one of the ureter passages? Ureters. Your ureter passages? Uh, at any one time, yes, but people often will come in with kidney stones, both kidneys, yep. maybe one in the ureter, maybe one sitting in the bladder. So you can come in with multiple stones. And how would you see that in a person? How would you know there would be multiple stones within them? So what happens typically, somebody would come in with pain, yes. with renal colic. Mm -hmm. uh, they would often end up in the emergency department. Mm -hmm. And almost always the history is straightforward, the physical findings. What are the symptoms? Uh, terrible pain okay. that comes and goes. Yeah. Nausea is oh. part of it. Okay. Uh, when that kidney swells, you, people get nauseous. Yeah. The pain often is centered in the flank area where the kidneys are. That's up by the rib cage. Okay. The pain travels down the flank down to the lower pelvic area. Oh. If a stone is close to the bladder, yes. they may present just with the feeling of the need to urinate all the time. They may not have that much flank pain. They may just come in with sort of localized pain and they're constantly needing to go to the bathroom, which can be confused with other conditions such as a urinary infection. But getting back to the patient, um, Usually, emergency room physicians would be right on top of this. They would realize, yes, this patient may have a stone, and they're going to order some type of x-ray or ultrasound to find out if they do. And is that when they contact you as a urologist to come in? Not necessarily. Okay. So they will contact us day or night if somebody is obstructed with a big stone or a small stone that's up high and the kidney is very obstructed. And can't get it down and out. Or they don't think they're going to pass the stone because it's a larger stone up high. Okay. Or, for instance, if somebody came in with an obstructing stone and a fever mm -hmm. representing an infection above the stone, that is generally a life and death situation. So the urologist will come in immediately to take care of that stone. And what will you do? In that situation, if somebody came in with a fever yes. and an infection, okay. What is done is the person is taken to what we call the cystoscopy suite. Mm -hmm. Generally, with some anesthesia, a scope is passed into the bladder. Mm -hmm. And through that scope, a flexible, thin, plastic wire, we call it a wire, but mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's made of plastic, is threaded up the ureter, past the stone, wherever it is, into the kidney. Mm -hmm. And then over that wire, we pass what is called a stent. Yes. A stent is a, obviously, it's a medically grade plastic tube okay. it's put in over the wire into the kidney it curls in the renal pelvis uh -huh. and as we take the wire out it just comes right down this ureter into the bladder and curls in there the wire is removed yeah. the stent is now draining the kidney is it catching the kidney stone and bringing no. it out no. no and people often think well does the stone go right down right. the opening no it doesn't work that way what, what happens what happens is the stone then just sits wherever it was in yeah. the ureter or in the renal pelvis, uh -huh. and then the next step is to get rid of the infection, right? Because it's dangerous to proceed with a major procedure to get rid of a stone in the midst of an infection. What can happen is during the procedure, there's increased pressure in the system, which can spread the infection into the bloodstream, and the person develops sepsis. Which what is, is sepsis? Sepsis is when bacteria are in the bloodstream. Yeah. They release various toxins. Uh -huh. And people can go into shock, their blood pressure can go down, they get critically ill. So the first step is to temporize the, the situation. When you say temporize, what do you mean? Get the stent in, okay. to drain the kidney, drain it. get rid of the infection with antibiotics. Okay. And then another day will come, probably in two, three weeks, maybe four weeks, when the patient is fit. And then you go back and get rid of the stone and take the stent out afterwards. And how do you get rid of the stone? How do you get it out of the system? All right, excellent question. Okay. So, that decision, of course, is based on a lot of different factors. Okay. It's based on where the stone is located. Okay. How many stones there are. Uh huh. Uh, the person's anatomy. Are they very obese? Um, Would it make a difference? Absolutely. Really. We're going to get into that. Okay. Um, how hard the stone is. So we, you had asked me originally what sort of x-rays, right. what do we do? Right. So that's part of the equation as to what we do. So I want to go back to that. Please do. For many people, first time stone, yes. what is done is called a, a stone CT scan, CAT scan. OK. 
Okay. PAT scan is basically a device that came out way back when I was in medical school in the 70s. Mm -hmm. Really quite a miraculous device. Mm -hmm. So what this machine does, the person is lying on a table and they go through this big hoop okay. and multiple x-rays are taken from all different directions. Okay. Those x-rays are manipulated by a computer and then you get a beautiful detailed anatomical picture of the body. Three-dimensional. Not three-dimensional, okay. but there are some that can make three-dimensional images. Okay. But you can see where the stones are, okay. how much obstruction there is, mm -hmm. how large the stones are, okay. and how hard the stones are. You can actually see how you hard they are. You can measure the density of the stones. Really? So those, all those factors come into play as to what you want to do. Okay. Another less uh, sophisticated way of telling, let's say somebody's had a lot of stones, okay. and you don't want to order a CAT scan. There's a number of reasons why you don't want to order a CAT scan. Why is that? Expense, All right. radiation exposure. Yep. So you order just a plain x-ray, mm -hmm. perhaps a plain x-ray and an ultrasound. And what will that show you? The plain x-ray often will show the stone where it's located. Mm -hmm. The ultrasound will show if the kidney's dilated. So ultrasound is just sound waves. So yes. That's no risk, no radiation. Right. Vibration. You can see if the kidney is dilated, and then the plain x-ray will show you where the stone is, hopefully. Mm -hmm how big it is, and how hard it is. If the plain x-ray doesn't show you where the stone is, then you're kind of in a quandary as to what to do. But that's also part of the equation as, how, as to how you handle that individual. So it's very much individualized, yes. and it requires a discussion. Of course. So if I had a patient across the table, and they have an obstructing stone, or even a non-obstructing stone, we discuss the various options which is best in their situation, mm -hmm. and there's always room for discussion. What is your best treatment based on efficacy, how effective it is, mm -hmm. risk, mm -hmm. what could happen to you during the procedure, mm -hmm. potential complications, and of course success rate. Mm -hmm. So we weigh all those in a discussion, and we can certainly get into detail on those. Let's talk about these right sure. now. Sure. So first I want to back up a minute. Okay. If you go back hundred years ago, yes. there was really no options for kidney stones or oh. ureteral stones. People ended up suffering. They did have pain medicine. Mm. The stones ultimately would pass or they wouldn't. Mm. And if a stone doesn't pass, you can end up with an obstruction leading to loss of a kidney. And if you have only two kidneys, mm. if you lose the other one, you're finished because there was no dialysis. If you had an infection above the stone, and they couldn't operate because there really wasn't surgery going back 100 years or so, people died. So what has happened over the past 40 to 50 years, truly miraculous. And I, as a urologist, was able to live through it and witness it because there have been dramatic changes. Really? You preface this discussion by saying, I believe, new approaches right. to an old disease. Exactly. So kidney stones have plagued humankind since the beginning of humans. But now, finally, we have extremely effective options. 50 years from now, maybe there's going to be a pill to dissolve a stone. I mean, patients often come in, I read this, a little uh, apple wine uh, vinegar. None of that's true unless it's a uric acid stone, which is potentially dissolvable. But those are rare. The other stones, calcium, calcium oxalate, calcium phosphate, we can't dissolve. So we have to do a procedure. Fortunately, the procedures that we have now which have been developed over the last 40 years, have revolutionized stone care. And most patients have an extremely uh, effective outcome, and they do well. So option one, it's called ESWL, extracorporeal, that means outside the body, shock wave lithotripsy. Okay. First developed in Germany. Really? First hit the America uh, continent probably in the mid-1980s. We started doing lithotripsy at the end of the 1980s. Okay. The first units were big units that people were loaded into a, a vat of water. Yeah. The old, older patients remember that. Uh, they were conscious. They were a little bit sedated. They were lowered into this vat of water. Were they sitting in anything? Sitting on, on, a, on, a, on a gantry, yes, and secured, of really? course. And, and their body was out. They weren't like secluded in a capsule or anything, no, were they? No, it's no. just like a big bathtub. Okay. And at the bottom of that bathtub, it looked like a big spark plug. Really? It, yes. It's a shock generator. Okay. And around that spark plug is this, I 
like it's made of brass, this okay. semicircular oval device. That spark plug would create a shock. Yeah. The oval would transition that shock into pulses of energy. Right. At the skin level, yep. there is obviously a force going through, but it's not that powerful. Right. The shock is focused right on the stone, where at that level, it's about 200 pounds per square inch, and multiple pulses are administered. For instance, in the kidney, the FDA has approved 2,500 shocks per treatment okay. per kidney. And at that point, that stone breaks up. So does the patient feel it? Yes. They do feel it. And yes. do, is it a painful feeling of the waves right. coming? So the original machine, yes. the shock wave was more broad-based. Okay. Meaning broad-based. Um, it wasn't as focused a shock. Okay. So On it, the direct aspect of where it was within the body? It was a broader base of energy, so more of the kidney was affected. Okay. But it was a very powerful shock, and people would feel it. So okay. they generally would have anesthesia. Really? The modern machines... Like a jolt? Uh, it would feel like somebody was punching your side. Really? And if somebody does that 2,000 times, you're, you're not going to be a happy camper. No, you're going to be very sore and painful. That's right. Yeah. So the newer machines are portable, a okay. lot of them. Uh -huh. uh, there's nothing standing at the hospital that comes in. They bring it into the OR, right. and it's a table. Uh, the person is put to sleep. Some okay. centers do it with just sedation. Well, with well, so when we say to sleep, it's general, through anesth general, general, general anesthesia. anesthesia. And what happens, it's the same spark plug. Okay. And that's brought up to the body with this big silicone soft um, device. No longer in water. No water. Okay. So that's brought up to the back, okay. and a shock goes through that area into the body to break up the stone. It's the same basic technology. But not in water. Not in water. And the newer machines, because the shock is more focused, yes. so there's less injury to the kidney. Yes. And because it's so focused, it's really essential to keep the patient still dur during the procedure. That's the reason for sedation. And that's why we like really beyond sedation, yeah. general anesthesia, because with sedation, people still feel the, uh, the pain, oh. and they move more. Oh. And if they move, it makes the procedure ineffective. But in essence, if a person came in with one stone, yes. let's say in the kidney or anywhere in the ureter, uh -huh. we could do shock wave. It's treat, the shocks come from the outside. There's no instrumentation in the body. Okay. The success rate depends on the size of the stone, right. the density of the stone, mm -hmm. and the size of the patient. So one of the problems we're having is with obesity. Yes. There's more, more layers to go through. There's more fat. Yes. More adipose. Yeah. And those shocks are subdued yes. when they go through. Of course. So if somebody is too big. It's like extra padding right, in the way. Shocks won't work. Okay, so, so then that, what do you do? Well, that's we're getting into the other options. Right. But just finishing on the yes. ESWL. Okay. So usually the person's done as an outpatient. Okay. They wake up in the recovery room. All they right. feel sore. They go home on pain medicine. And then the stone, which was originally a lot bigger, is now usually passed with fine grains of sand without much pain. And is there things that they need to do afterwards? Yes. There's a number of things. Okay. They stay well hydrated. Yep, they drink plenty of water. There are certain pills, medication that helps the exiting of stones by relaxing the ureter. Really? Stretching the ureter. Like what types of medication? They're called selective alpha-1 blockers. Oh. So they block the nerve endings to the ureter, and it allows the stones to pass easier and with, with less pain. So they've come into vogue the last five years. Again, another innovation. Yes. And that allows the stones to come out usually without much pain. Okay. Often the person will be asked to strain their urine so we can collect the stones. What do you mean by that? Well, they just urinate through a filter. You could use a coffee filter. Uh, there are filters that are made for stones. That so it's in order to allow the urine to go through the filter but to catch the stone so that you yes. could actually see it? Stone particles. Uh-huh. That's all often helpful. They bring the stones in so as the urologist... I know they're passing a five millimeter stone. I want to see the debris that comes through. Sometimes the x-ray will show the stone only poorly and you're not really sure if, this, if the procedure was effective. So I know we're going to continue on the different types of treatments, but if somebody presents with the stone, does that mean that they're more prone to have more stones? If they don't change their fluid, their diet, their behavior, there's about a 50% recurrence over the next 10 years. So 
what are the most important things people can do related to that when we you say flu? We want to get into that versus yeah, the Yeah, let's other catch procedure? that right now, and then we'll go back to All the right. procedures. Well, I think the number one thing to do is drink water. Okay. And so is that at least uh, six to eight, eight ounces of water a day? Good question. Yeah. So fluid intake is based on a number of uh, parameters. Okay. Are you exercising? Mm -hmm. Are you perspiring? Right. What's the ambient temperature? Mm -hmm. All those things you have to weigh in. Okay. So ideally, if a person is a stone former, yep. we coach the people to produce approximately, again, we use metric, two liters of urine per day. Which is equivalent to? Two quarts, two approximately. Quarts. Okay. So you can tell people to actually measure it, aim for two quarts a day. The other way, what I use Of drinking water. No, of what's coming out. Of what's coming out. So in order to get that, how much do you have to drink? It could be a lot more than two quarts. That's what I so would think. So I'll tell you, if I'm working in the yard and yeah. I'm perspiring, yeah. I may need a gallon of water in four hours. All right, that's important to know. So hydration is key. Now, thirst is an indicator of hydration. Okay. And for most people, thirst is more than adequate. But if you're a stone former yes. and you want to lower your risk, you've got to drink more. Oh. So you're forcing yourself to drink even when you're not thirsty. And the best thing to drink is water. Plus something else, but again, I just want to finish how much. Okay. So the two quarts a day, if you want to measure it. The okay. other way is just look at the bowl. If the urine looks clear like water, you're well hydrated. That's good to know. The because darker the urine, yellow is moderately concentrated, orange, very concentrated. That means they need so to drink more you gotta water. you got to drink, and you got to drink before you go to bed. Ah, but won't that get you up to go to the bathroom it in the middle may, of the night? It may, but you want to cut that risk. Okay. So what do you want to put in your water? Okay. Lemon juice. Lemon juice? Lemon juice. Really? Forget the apple wine vinegar. Yeah. Lemon juice is a powerful um, agent to keep stones in solution. Remember we talked about solubility? Mm -hmm. So it turns out that the urine actually is carrying four times as much solutes, such as calcium, Meaning as, as crystals, crystals. Than, than water can hold. Really? Why is that? Yeah. Why can it carry that without it crystallizing out four times? Hmm. Because there are inhibitors in the urine. One of the key inhibitors, what I mean by inhibitor, yes. is something that keeps those stones in solution, is citrate. Which is? Get it from lemon juice. Ah. So lemon juice is high. You can get it in orange juice. Okay. You can get it in grapefruit juice, but grapefruit juice for many people, not something that doctors encourage because it affects the liver wow. and the breakdown of medications. In a negative so way. you would have to check with your doctor to make sure grapefruit juice is acceptable. But lemon juice is inexpensive. Yeah. You can buy real lemons or buy that bottle of that green real lemon. Yeah. How and much? Generally, if you put it one to two ounces mm -hmm. in a quart of water a day, mm -hmm. And that would be really, that would be good. Now, Dr. Gary, one of the things they say about lemon, though, that it can affect your teeth. Like dentists will say, be careful of having lemon because the acid can okay. affect the structure of the teeth. I would then advise the person to drink with a straw. With a straw? Why not? Okay, so it doesn't directly bypass impact the it. teeth. Bypass sure. the teeth. Would an essential, a high-quality organic essential um, lemon oil uh, a drop or two in water be helpful and do the same thing? I couldn't comment on that. Okay. <clears throat> we know that lemon juice, an ounce of lemon juice, gives the person the equivalent of a prescription tablet that we can prescribe. Really? Called Eurocit K. So okay. that's potassium citrate. Okay. They do market those tablets. They are somewhat pricey. It's cheaper to do the lemon, lemon juice. Lemon juice, yes. But you don't have to only do lemon juice. Okay. There are lots of fluids that are high in citrate. Like? For instance, if you did uh, crystal light, lemon, or other citrus flavors, that's high in citrus. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of the pop drinks, sodas, are frowned upon for other reasons. Right, not good for you. But if it says citric acid on the back uh -huh. as one of the components, that's citrate. Okay, but Phos the better off is probably just the lemon acid, juice. Yes. Phosphoric acid, on the other hand, is bad. Okay. So it can, they, they acidify these drinks with okay. um, phosphoric or citric acid. The citric acid is what you want. Okay, so we want to increase the water, and we also want to add at least once a day that little bit of lemon in there? Absolutely. Okay, so what else can people do? Salt. Salt. What about salt? Avoid. Increase their intake or avoid it? 
avoid it. Avoid all salt. So what happens? Now, there's salt in everything, especially in prepared food. Current recommendations are 2,000 milligrams a day. Mm -hmm. If you're a stone former, you've got to be extremely careful regarding salt intake. Okay. So remember we talked about the kidneys help control the salt level in the body? Yes. In the human body, the salt level is maintained an absolutely stable level, 140. Okay. And that's, salt is the critical uh, factor in cells, mm -hmm. cell health. Yes. Without salt, we're not here. Right. We're, we're basically salt water. Really? But the kidneys control the salt level by excreting excess salt. Ah. And guess what happens when it excretes excess salt? What happens? It carries calcium with it. Really? So for every extra gram of salt that's coming out, you are carrying a lot of calcium. Really? And one of the best ways to modify kidney stone formation is right. by cutting back on salt. Okay, so plenty of water, cut back on the salt. Third thing. Diet. Yes. Diet is intrinsic in the formation of stone formation. So what you eat, what, what should you avoid? Well, I think there are a number of key factors. Okay. Number one, you had mentioned that the rate of stone formation is going up astronomically. It really is. I mean, it's doubled over the past 20 years. And in New Hampshire, are we seeing a lot more? New Hampshire is a relatively high stone uh, rate. It is about 10% of the population. Mm -hmm. When I started in practice, mm. it was about 3.5%. Really? So it's definitely So why increased. is that? Why is it? It's diet and it's obesity. Okay. We know there's an obesity epidemic in this country. There is. That changes the metabolism of the body. Just being obese, mm -hmm. you then unfortunately end up with what's called metabolic syndrome. Mm -hmm. That alters the body chemistry and people make a lot more stones. I think that is the major reason why we're seeing the stone rate explode. But it's also what people are eating. Okay. So we know that a diet that's high in animal protein. Yes. So we're talking eating animal meat. We're eating meat, chicken, fish, turkey, animal protein. Yes. That changes the acidity of the body. Okay. It lowers it. Okay. More acid coming out means more uric acid. That's the waste product. That means more stones. Okay. Because even though people don't form uric acid stones, they're forming predominantly calcium oxide stones. Sure. Uric acid acts as what we say a nidus. A Which nidus means? is just a small crystal. And that allows those calcium oxide crystals to form despite the increased solubility of the urine. Mm -hmm. Having that nidus of uric acid just sucks it right out and you start making stones. Wow. So are you saying then that it, if you are prone to kidney stones, perhaps the best intake of food and the best diet for you would be to be a vegetarian? I, well, I think it's a personal choice. Yes. But I just met with a person this morning in my yeah. office, yeah. talked about stone formation. Sure. And they actually make uric acid stones. And we had the same conversation. Yeah. Certainly cutting back on animal protein mm. is, is very important. Mm -hmm. I don't think or I don't believe they have to be totally vegetarian. Small amounts of animal protein, if that's their persuasion, is acceptable. But they definitely should have more uh, fruits and vegetables. Uh, carbs are okay in moderation and less animal protein. Okay. Absolutely. That's important. So those are three. Water. Salt. Salt. To do away with salt. Less than that yeah. salt. And the diet that you take, that it is a less animal fat. Another factor. Okay. I mean, I start pulling out the little bit of hair that I have left. Yes. <laughs> if somebody tells me they're on a diet yes. and they're going with, I don't want to use names of diets, okay. obviously, but if they're going to a high animal protein diet, yeah. low carb, yeah. I tell them, don't do it. Don't do You're it. You're going to make more stones. Okay. Don't do it. Okay. Everything in moderation. All right. So now we've covered the four components of what you can do to prevent kidney stones. Let's go back to treatment now. Sure. You weren't finished with that. So let's finish yep. with that. So well, we covered lithotripsy. You did. Lithotripsy, what other things? the other parameter, we really didn't discuss density and size of the stone with lithotripsy. So in general, yes. if somebody has a stone that's larger than two centimeters mm. stuck in the kidney, yeah. lithotripsy is not a good choice. Okay. So two centimeters is approximately three quarters of an inch. Mm -hmm. Why isn't it a good a choice? Because the lithotriptor works best on smaller stones. And if you've got a big stone, two centimeters, I'll just draw a little picture. Mm -hmm. 
And it's usually a regular, let's say it's a stone about yay big. That's about a two centimeter stone. Well, that's about that size almost. Yep. Yeah. You spend mm -hmm. 30 minutes or 40 minutes using 2,500 shocks, mm -hmm. maybe you're going to get that much out of there. Wow, that's not much. Not much. Not much and something and that needs to pass. the procedure requires anesthesia. Yeah. It's also expensive. Mm -hmm. It's time out of work. Mm. So you probably want something more effective. Right. What would that be? Up to two centimeters, though, doing a lithotripter is reasonable, especially if the stone is soft. Oh. So a dense stone, yes. less likely to break up. A soft stone, you can tell that on CAT scan or plain x-ray. It just doesn't look hard. It, and we measure that on a CAT scan. We can actually get the units of uh, density. Uh -huh. On a plain x-ray, you simply compare it to the bone. You'll mm -hmm. see the backbone. Mm -hmm. And the stone could look as dense. It's very white or sort of hazy and soft. So even a large stone, if it's not more than two centimeters, though, okay. if it's sort of hazy and it's not dense, you can use a lithotripter. Okay. But if you have a large hard stone in the right. kidney. Then what do you do? Or if there's a large hard stone in the ureter. Yes. You're going to want different procedure. What would that be? Uh, the next procedure would be called ureteroscopy. Okay. When I started out in urology back in the early 80s, it didn't exist. Really? I mean, just think about that, wow. 30, 35 years ago. It's amazing. So back then, yep. if somebody had a bad stone, yep. fortunately we had anesthesia, we had scalpels, uh -huh. we would open the person up, yep. open the ureter up, uh -huh. take out the stone, sew it up, open the kidney, sew it up. So urologists were busy every day operating on kidneys and ureters. Fortunately, what came out was a minimally invasive procedure. Mm -hmm. This is called endourology. Okay. within the body, uh -huh. urology. So we have effective tools now to go through the urethra yes. with the person asleep, yep. up the ureter, yes. anywhere in the ureter, anywhere in the kidney, break up the stones, remove the stones or just break them up just like the lithotriptor does into fine particles uh -huh. and allow the stones to pass. Mm. So ureteroscopy has come a long way. Okay. 35 years ago, the instruments were much bigger. Okay. Now we have cameras on the instruments, so we're not looking through. We can see everything on a big screen. Okay. We have flexible scopes that can go all the way up and bend anywhere in the kidney. Okay. We have rigid scopes that are very effective in the ureter, uh -huh. not so effective in the kidney. Okay. And we have a laser, holmium laser. Holmium laser. Holmium laser. That is the number one laser used throughout the world to break up stones. Uh -huh. And what it looks like is a tiny little fiber. Okay. It's bigger than a, than a hair follicle, but not much. And through that fiber comes light energy, intensified light energy. Hmm. So the urologist passes the scope up to the stone. Yes. The fiber goes very close to the stone. Yeah. And then the urologist presses on a pedal, and release it. it. And it's like Star, it's like they get Star Wars. Really? Yeah. That's neat. I like it. Yeah. <laughs> that is neat. So it pulses and it... Pulses of light. Pulses so, of light that help it to break up. And when it's in the ureter... Very easy, you pass, after you break it up, yeah. that stone was too big to pass, so you've broken it up. Sure. And then you can pass what's called a basket, uh -huh. which is made of plastic. And this goes up the ureter. Up the ureter through okay. the scope, yep. and it has usually three or four prongs. Catches it. You open it up, close it, and pull it out. Wow. And this is done when the person is under anesthesia, That's so they correct. don't feel it. Now, when the stone is in the ureter, mm -hmm. Generally, that procedure will take 30 minutes to an hour, and you can get all the stones out. Mm -hmm. Success rate is 95%. And what happens to the person after? Are they pain-free? What do they need to do after that? Okay, well, usually after your ureteroscopy, remember we talked about stents? Yes. Typically, a stent is put in for several days. And a stent is, That's again... That's that plastic tube. Yep. The reason is the ureteroscope, even though it's fine, yes. the ureter is even finer. So it causes so a little irritation. The ureter can get irritated and then yeah. goes into spasm. Ooh, yeah, that can so be the painful. stent allows that spasm, that inflammation to go away. As it's allowing the urine to pass through. Allows the ureter to heal. Very interesting. And then the stent is removed mm -hmm. and the patient has minimal to no pain. Wow. The stents themselves, unfortunately, in some people can be painful. Oh. So we try to limit uh, the duration of the stent. Right. Typically, it's a few days to a week. Because it's a foreign body in the body, yeah. But it's serving good. Right. Ureters can be injured. 
during the ureteroscopy. Oh, no. So again, this is a very fine material. It's not thick like this. Right. And it can be almost paper thin. Oh. So if a stone gets caught in the ureter, uh -huh. it could almost be poking through the wall of the ureter already. We go up, we're careful, we have all these instruments. When you start hitting a stone with a laser, it could go through the ureter. What do you do in that case? There, there are other reasons. So that, that would be called a perforation. Okay. It could happen for other reasons as well. But a perforation is not loss of a ureter. It's like a little flap. So you just put the stent in, the flap closes. Usually within a day or so, it heals. No, it heals. Oh, but you don't it's an amazing part of the body, isn't it? Body heals. Without yep. the body's intelligence, we would be dead in the water. But it's very true. The body knows how to heal itself. It it's does. an amazing thing. It has its own intelligence. It does have its own intelligence. So that stent is put in as a scaffold to allow the ureter to heal in an open fashion. Yes. Without the stent, you're more likely to get scar tissue. Oh. And if you get scar tissue, then you get obstruction even without a stone leading to the need for more surgery. I but see. perforation rate with modern equipment, yes. urologist that's well trained, it's very low now. Okay. I mean, totally different than 30 years ago. Is that the preferable treatment? It's preferable depending on the patient's choice. Okay. For instance, uh -huh. let's say you came to my office yes. and you came in with a stone stuck, uh, let's say it's down here, okay. down low, mm -hmm. and it's an eight millimeter stone. My conversation would go like this. We can do the ESWL, mm -hmm. extracorporeal shock wave lift, the TRIPSI. Yeah. You're not overweight. Mm -hmm. The stone is moderate density. Mm -hmm. We're talking about all these things. Mm -hmm. If I treat you, mm -hmm. I would say the success rate with that 8 millimeter stone is about 70%. Mm -hmm. But I'm not going in your body. Mm -hmm. There's not a lot of pain. Mm -hmm. There's no risk of perforation. Okay. But it may not work. Okay. So you've taken off time from work. Yeah cost you money for your insurance plan. Mm -hmm. um, that's one option. Mm -hmm. Option two, mm -hmm. put you to sleep. I'll go up with a scope. Yep. Success rate about 95%. Really? The risk of a perforation, maybe 1%. Okay. Stent's going to be in for two days to a week. Okay. You may or may not have significant pain from the stent. Okay. What would you like me to do? Mm. So it's the person's choice. And then from their perspective of healing afterwards, well, usually, How quickly is no the matter, recovery? as long as there's no complications, and usually there isn't, okay. uh, people quickly recover. What For type of complications? Well, perforation okay. would be the that main would be one. The one. So a people... after a lithotripsy, yeah. generally the person's back at work the next day. After the ureteroscopy, usually the next day or the day after. Wow. Are there any other treatments that we haven't covered? Yes. Go ahead, because we're just kind of summarizing here. Yeah. So if somebody has a large stone, remember when I said two centimeters is the cutoff for lithotripsy in the right. kidney? Yes. Well, with the ureteroscope, we mm -hmm. can also go up into the kidney. Mm -hmm. But once again, a really big stone, mm. I could be there for six hours. Wow. So this, the laser is tiny, yes. and you gradually fragment the stone into little pieces. The pulsation. Yes. Mm -hmm. So you've got two choices. You have to be very patient with that. You, it, it's a very delicate patient procedure. So you can basket those stones out, or what we call uh, dusting uh, maneuver. So the stones are just broken up into lots of small pieces. You leave the stent in to dilate the ureter. You're actually, the ureter gets bigger if the stent's left in for more than a week to 10 days. Take out the stent, and then typically all that dust will come through. If the stone is larger, and you don't want to break up too much stone up there, it does take a lot of time, mm -hmm. but also all those particles have got to pass, and even the fine particles could get caught, and then you're stuck going back up with your ureteroscope to get, out, get them out of there. Mm -hmm. So another alternative for large kidney stones mm -hmm. is called percutaneous procedures. And what do you do in that? So that's a team approach. Mm -hmm. Usually it's the radiologist. The radiologist okay. with the patient under sedation or anesthesia, general anesthesia, mm -hmm. will put a needle into the kidney. It's generally a calyx okay. over in this area. Mm -hmm. And over that needle, they use a dilator. Okay either a sleeve system where they gradually dilate or a balloon, mm -hmm. and then a large tube is passed directly into the kidney. It's about the size of my index finger. Really? Once that's in there, the urologist then goes through that port, yes. and the equipment we can use through the larger tube is bigger uh -huh. and very effective at removing large stones. We can use suction. Mm -hmm. We can use something called ultrasonic lithotripsy. The machine can very quickly break up the stone, and we can pull out the fragments. Fascinating. 
fascinating. So we've covered all the levels of the different treatments that can be done. So uh, is this something hereditary, kidney stones? It is. Well, to some degree. To some degree. So that's also debatable. So approximately 15% or so of families, you see stones run in that family. But is it, is it genetic? Yeah. If it is, there's multiple genes involved. Or is it just cultural? I mean, the people eat and drink mm -hmm. generally Whoever you hang out with, those are, you know, you can have the same diet, same sort of water, although it will vary. But yes, it can run in families, and especially if you see children with stones, Sorry. it was probably inherited. Now, when we drink water, I know you said to wrap up that uh, plenty of water is important to drink. Uh, reducing salt intake is important, and our diet to make sure that we have a low animal uh, component to our uh, animal protein. Animal protein. So, is there a difference of water? of well water versus regular water for people to drink, and carbonated water versus non-carbonated water? Good question. Mm -hmm. So there was debate for a long time. We just have about two and a half minutes. So we <laughs> Yes, please, so just wrap that up. I mean, well water can be high in calcium carbonate, which is a component of some stones, yes. but it's been found that in general it's not a factor. Okay. So water is water as long as it's clean. Clean water is critically um, important. What was your other question? I'm sorry. Uh, the difference of soda water. Carbonated water Not doesn't, good. doesn't, no, it doesn't make a difference. Okay. It's fine. All right, then. So well, one, one other thing with diet. Yes. So high fructose diets. Yes, which uh, means what? Simple sh uh, sugars like corn syrup. Yes. Not good. Not good at all. It creates higher calcium levels mm -hmm. and less citrate in the urine. Okay, so what so, should people avoid so that they don't have stones? Because they can really make a difference as far well, as their I, food intake. I think in general, if somebody keeps their weight down, okay. obesity, yeah. drinking a lot of fluid. Drinking a lot of water. This is for stone forms. Okay. And in general, for everybody. They it should is. keep the weight down for general health. Right. Avoid excess salt. Yes. Try to cut back on the animal protein. Okay. Exercise regularly. That has actually been shown to be an independent factor in stone prevention. And the types of exercise would be, what, 20 minutes a day, 30 minutes a day, walking? Does it have to be rigorous out in the gym and really moving it? Or I think that's definitely age-dependent. Okay. So, you, I mean, just walking 20, 30 minutes a day as people get older is more than enough. Okay. And how young can stones come into being in a person? You had mentioned that even in children. It does. We are seeing more and more, and unfortunately, we're seeing a lot of obese children. Right. It makes it more difficult to get rid of the stones because their bodies are smaller. Right. But the same three approaches are available. Intake of water, more water, less salt, and uh, animal less pro animal proteins, and a good healthy diet. More citrate. More citrate. And you can get that by adding lemon into your water Correct. and being able to drink, or even a little bit of orange juice, orange if, juice you, yep. if you prefer that. Or but It's uh, caloric. It's caloric. So that will help. Uh, Dr. Gary, this has been very, very helpful. Um, I really appreciate your being on the show because, as we know, kidney stones, we're seeing more and more of it, and it can be very painful. And the most important thing is it's preventable. It's preventable by what we eat, by drinking more water, by lowering our salt intake, and by making sure that we exercise. And this show is all about helping people to have the knowledge that they need so that they can be proactive in their health. So if you would have any questions or would like further information or other questions that you would like answered, go to info at YCD, ycdholistichealing.com. In the meantime, we wish you well, keep healthy, eat well, drink plenty of water, lower your salt intake, and get a very good nutritious diet, lowering the animal fat contact. Have a wonderful day. The preceding program was provided by an independent producer solely responsible for its content. The opinions expressed do not necessarily represent the views of this station, its staff, board of directors, or underwriters.